Thanks for coming. This is the uh, last uh, conversation of the year. Uh, and I, I actually don't have an agenda. Uh, what I'd rather do is uh, just get your thoughts, questions, comments, and things like that, and just move kind of organically from there. So um, let me hear your thoughts. Every one of you, I'm sure, came with, with something in mind. So uh, let's just kind of open the open up the forum and uh, and have a conversation. Yes, Bruce. Data legislative process that's going on now. How it affect the uh, the uh, ledge meetings that are going on right now. The what we put in uh, from the university and our our absolute top priority. Uh, was to get the monies that are associated with the what we call the UPA pay raise. Um, and that's uh, a total, when you put it all together, of both the uh, repayments and, and future raises uh, amounts to about $33 million. And so far, uh, everything is going according to plan there. Um, and so that's, that's the really good news, is, is we think... Uh, uh, things are on on track uh, for success there, and we hope. And uh, we're really uh, glad that the the ledge and the governor appreciate uh, uh, what the university faculty do uh, for the state. So that's the the good news, and that's by far the biggest uh, thing. We have a lot of other uh, smaller items that have that are receiving support um, from the legislature and so on. Many of which. We didn't even initiate, but they're all good things uh, that are going through. So, f so far, things are going well. One of the uh, big parts of our budget was uh, a proposal to float revenue bonds uh, going forward that help us to work on the $400 million of deferred maintenance. Uh, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for the campus. This deferred maintenance uh, 400 million dollars has really accrued over decades um, and just so people understand how it comes about you know every year we get money to do repairs and maintenance R&M for the campus in addition to new building that we do and over the years the money for R&M hasn't kept up with the need when you put in certain systems in buildings let's say it's uh, HVAC system that has a certain lifetime associated with it. And so when you spend money to put a building up with its different systems, inherent in, it, in that is a repairs and maintenance budget uh, for as long as the building exists. And of course, that number actually escalates with time as the buildings age. And over the last three or four decades, really, the R&M money that's been allocated has never been quite enough to keep up with the repairs and maintenance. Whatever doesn't get done in a given year in R&M is then put into a category called deferred maintenance because it wasn't finished. That deferred maintenance now is about $400 million uh, system-wide and about $350 million of that is on this campus. The total value of the campus physical plant here is, is probably about three to three and a half billion dollars. Uh, so about 10% of the value of this campus is now in deferred maintenance. And that's a lot. That's a lot of, you know, broken toilets, inefficient heating and ventilation systems, painting that's not done, rugs that aren't done, old-fashioned uh, systems and so on. And so in order to bring the campus back up, we need to invest on the order of three to four hundred million dollars over the next uh, six to ten years to try to get our campus completely rehabilitated. So it's a great opportunity. Yes? And he explained to me what he found out was that part of the problem is the University of Hawaii is not willing to hire people to do the maintenance. So they have a huge backlog of maintenance. And even if the legislature allocated the money, it wouldn't get done. So this is only half the problem. Yes, the problem is here, but if you're not going to hire people to do the work, 
then you're no further ahead. And How are you going to address that? And that? Well, that's exactly right. And that's why we put in to the budget request to the ledge uh, 22 positions here at Manoa and an additional 17 at the system. So a total of 39 positions we also requested in this budget. So we're asking them to pay for the people. We know we're short of people. Uh, we raised that. I, I let Isaac know that, in fact. We have a report from a group called Sightlines that came to campus about four years ago to do a look at the deferred maintenance. And they told us we're 90 people short in the facilities maintenance area. We have about 360 people in that area. That's 90 short. So we're working at about 80 percent. Uh, so we put in our request, and it's in the Board of Regents budget request. Uh, Isaac knows of those. Isaac and I have had many conversations about those positions. We consider them absolutely essential. Now, having said that, we do $50 million a year in repair and maintenance on the campus with the people we currently have. Uh, that's a lot of people working really hard. But we know we need more people. Uh, we've made this request. Uh, we're hoping they'll fund it. If they give us the money without the people, we're in trouble because we don't have the people to do that additional. We're talking about doing, if you think about it, if you take that 400 million and even spread it out over 10 years, that's an extra 40 million. We do about 50 million a year. We're talking about going from 50 to 90 million a year in that kind of work. So we've asked for those positions and I'm, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed uh, that they see the wisdom of funding the people which is every bit as important, if not more important, than the money. So we're on that. Uh, we let Isaac know about that. We put it in our budget. Uh, and uh, we're hoping for his endorsement. Uh, is there a plan for an athletic fee increase? There's not. Uh, the, uh, the buzz of that whole thing came at a Board of Regents meeting when we were talking about trying to make a sustainable model for athletics. And uh, in addition to all the other things we're doing, which is enhanced fundraising, uh, we really have a, a, a fundraising plan now called the Game Plan. We're also trying to work with the ledge on, on supporting athletics better trying to think about going forward how we interact with the stadium authority uh, and hoping for some better deals there, trying to get more students to come to games, uh, sell more tickets and so on. Uh, and I made the comment that we need to at least look at the athletic fee. It is low, uh, but there's no plan. That's kind of a last resort. It's the last thing I'd like to do. But we need to look at it, and that's a, I think that's a uh, you know, you got to put everything on the table when you're running a deficit. Uh, as you know, I've given uh, the athletic director three years to get the program to break even. Uh, that was part of the deal we made when we absolved the athletic department debt. And uh, so we're looking at a three-year window uh, in order to get that program to, to be in the black. And uh, I've tried to make it very clear how important that is to the whole community because athletics is really all about the whole state of Hawaii so everybody's got to contribute. Uh, the students are doing their part and I hope that we don't have to increase a fee. Uh, that would be my absolute last. I'd, I'd like to see more support from donors, corporations, the community, the stadium authority and, and the ledge and see if we can make athletics break even or turn a profit uh, without asking the students to pick up more of the tab. Good question so far. Ah, there we are. Uh, rental, so running the state, running the sheriff center and so on, that goes to the athletics department budget. That's one of the ways that they raise revenue. Yeah. 
Yeah, typically the, the unit that, that owns the, the facility uh, gets most of that rental. It probably depends on the different, it probably depends on the different organization. The athletics ones, the, the money goes to athletics and the other areas. Well, yeah, I, I know that's not true. Uh, yeah. We'll look into it. I, I, I know that's not true in athletics, but it may well, be in some of the I can. Well, <coughs> but uh, so what was your? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that that we have to deal with as a campus is how we charge out for different things. Right now, we don't have a way to, so units get free electricity in a way, and we don't send bills out to different units depending on how much electricity they use. Um, we might need to think about that because if you want to get people to conserve, if it goes to their bottom line, they can think about turning the lights out. Right now, we pay all the electric bills centrally from our office using tuition funds, unless you're talking about Kaka'ako, um, which pays its own electricity. So we have to think about those kinds of things. We have some major electricity users uh, that use an inordinate amount of electricity, uh, and they're sort of being subsidized by everybody else. So we have a lot of kind of the micros of that, uh, you know, and, and that, that really does come back to who should get the revenues. Well, it's one thing to disperse revenues, but then you've got to disperse expenses. So who pays to keep the facilities in the position they are? And right now, we're very centralized in terms of that, except for athletics and Kaka'ako, uh, who pay their own maintenance fees and things like that. So that's a, it's a live question, actually, that the, right now the vice chancellors are looking at in terms of budgeting models. It's a good, good question. This is sort of related. I don't know when you started, you said you started up in August and you're supposed to try to apply it, but now it's part of the summer. And I think you were going to look into how to make the course and you might need to have it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, a lot of that's going on. In fact, we have a, a actually a much more vigorous summer program than we usually do, and we're looking at other. Actually, one of the great conversations we just had in our last dean's directors meeting was thinking about also a small winter session that might help us do some really unique things. Uh, have make that facilitate more study abroad, more service learning, short opportunities short courses, and in fact, one of the other potential benefits of that is someone who's on a, let's say, a track that requires previous courses, like an engineering track. Uh, if you take Physics 1 and you need Physics 2 and you don't do so well in Physics 1, normally you're out of sync now and your, your, your chances of continuing through the program are, are hurt, but if you get a redo semester, a short five-week term, for example, where you can retake that course, you can get back on track. So we're looking at, at ways to make the campus more a 12-month campus, better utilize the, this $3 billion of physical plant. So there's a lot happening already, uh, but more, more is envisioned. Peter.
Yeah, it, th that's a, a great question, and I'll say that the magnitude of the problem has grown so enormously. So this year our electric bill will probably be 39 million. Um, our whole utility bill will be 52 million. Um, seven million of that's water, and three quarters of that seven is cooling towers in a place where the temperature is never more than 15 degrees from room temperature. Uh, so um, the, the, the opportunities for saving are enormous. Uh, just this morning I read a proposal uh, from one of our major engineers in town who's also a major donor to look at perhaps going to a microgrid uh, here on campus as a pilot project that, that has the potential to save 25% on electricity. And we formed a little task force to look at some of these, these things with some experts here, both from our facilities and grounds, but also HNEI and so on. Because the magnitude of the problem with the rates going up at the, our electric bill was $11 million a decade ago, and now it's 39. So it has grown so enormously that now it's getting more attention than ever. Um, but we really need to do something about it. I mean, $39 million, we have 15,000 undergraduates paying tuition. Uh, so you see the, the enormous cost it is to each of them. And the other thing is that we do, because we pay it centrally, people don't have to think about their energy usage. We now have a new IT building. Um, it itself, running it, will be several million dollars a year, but it does have the potential for us to get all of our servers there in that building so that we can cool one building and maybe not have to spend as much on air conditioning uh, in other parts of the campus. The deferred maintenance is tied directly into that because when we redid Moore Hall, we cut down with our HVAC system, we cut their energy usage by 48%. So there's, there's some enormous potential there as we do both deferred maintenance but also look at perhaps going to a microgrid. We're redoing the, the substation. We run our own grid, so we're not on HECO's grid. And that gives us some flexibility here. And we, we are redoing the substation over by the East-West Center. Uh, so there are real possibilities. The other is seawater air conditioning. We're having conversations with the group that's doing Waikiki. Uh, and they believe they can come up here to campus and do campus. They can get, you know, Midpac and Punahou and some of the other uh, ones that are a little further uphill. It's, it's doable, it's physically doable uh, to bring the water up here and use seawater, deep seawater. Uh, so we're looking at all of those things, but the, the motivation, the driving force for action is much bigger now than it used to be because of that enormous cost. So, I guess the answer is there, there haven't been a whole lot of studies in the past, but it's so big now that, that it's getting a lot more attention, which is a good thing. Can I follow up on that? When we both entered this room th uh, today, we felt it's very cold. And I have the same feeling when I enter our auditorium. So couldn't we just uh, university-wide give a decree that everything has to go up for a few degrees? I mean, basically not cool it down that far? keep it this cold is to save money because the system works by taking the feed air and lowering down to the dew point to take the humidity out and then reheating so by not reheating as much we're saving that's how antiquated our systems are and that's why when we redo them like Moore Hall we actually we actually can save a lot of money by using more modern systems and particularly if we can get the you know people are you're perfectly comfortable at 85 degrees if, if air is passing by. You know, we're, we're 90 some plus degrees. We're perfectly comfortable at 85 as long as the air is moving. And so ceiling fans and things like that, we'd be perfectly comfortable in here if we had ceiling fans and it was 85 and no air conditioning. And it's rarely above 85 outside. But we have a system that was built back when energy was cheap you know, most of our buildings are hermetically sealed or, or very hard to open windows. Uh, but as we do deferred maintenance and we have this opportunity, we should definitely think about low energy usage systems. Kuykendall is, is going to be a classic example. It's one of our largest buildings. 
Um, and we, so far, by the way, it looks like we're going to get money to do the Kuykendall renovation. It's still in the budget and still looking good. That will use zero energy, zero net energy. And uh, that can be a model uh, for other buildings. And it will be one of our biggest, it's one of our biggest buildings uh, when, you, when you take both halves. And that will be a model. And we, we can beat, we can work on this. We can definitely chip it away. Uh, and that, that's a, a chance for enormous savings. I walk around, walk around the campus, usually leaving around 8, 9 o'clock in the evening. Last night, the new building here, the uh, campus fitness center, the entire building was blazing with lights. The uh, stadium down there usually has their floodlights on very, very late at night. I wonder sometimes if conservation is really being addressed in a very focused. I think I just lost some part of your program here, but I was wondering why these very blatant examples are still going on when we have such a high energy bill. Murals, and uh, they go pretty late at night. Um, so there may have been a game going on there, a soccer game or something. I, you know, I don't know for sure. Uh, and it could be the campus center lights are on because they're trying to finish it. <laughs> Again, I don't know for sure, but it is so late and so overdue that uh, may be that they're they're doing uh, kind of touch up on the campus. I don't know for sure. Having said that, there's no question that we're, we don't have conservation top of mind in everybody's mind. Um, and you know, some of that again comes back to who's paying the bills. And right now, people, people, the the attitude could easily be, well, somebody else is paying the bill. Uh, and so we got to drive it down home, I think, and and start thinking about, you know, the kinds of cost measures that make people make it top of mind. And right now, it isn't. So. Building independently accountable in terms of how much energy they're using, what kind of equipment has to be put in, et cetera. Is anything being done concretely in that direction? That usage and, and, and put a little Faraday coil around a wire and figure out how much amperage it's pulling and so on. But what we really want is something that integrates that over the day and we can look at the usage, measure it, and ultimately, you know, if you want conservation, you can charge a fraction of that to the, to the unit. Dollars, the unit. Yep, you're right. In fact, uh, a compass competition would be, you know, facilitated competition would be something that would really raise people's consciousness about their usage, you know, students and the other people, faculty, etc. Thank you. And maybe then that would help to push awareness for conservation. Get your students involved. Maybe the engineering department or, you know, natural sciences or something like that. Put this out as a project. And maybe you can even have different courses of study compete with each other in terms of ideas. But get the students involved, actually involved in this. And maybe you'll see something better. And, and you're educating your students at the same time.
sustainability projects that students are working on right now. So absolutely, that's one of our best resources and that's why we I just wanted to say that in the Department of Information and Computer Sciences, we've had this going for three years, this Kukui Cup uh, and the dorms, and, and it has worked. Uh, we've used gamification, essentially, to reduce the dorm uh, energy, and it's been a competition, and it's worked very well. Yeah, actually, uh, Susan just told me, most of the data we got in the design of Kuykendall was, was student projects. Uh, looking at a longer view, fact. Have I found things that I could and could not do without permission? Uh, many yeah, things that you thought, oh, well, I've got to talk to everybody, and it actually turns out, you know, the campus itself can move forward without going up some chain of command. And then the other way around, that you thought you really had the authority to do things, but it didn't turn out that way. Uh, I Things have been in both categories. For sure. Could you give some examples? Well, you know, I'll leave that to, to another time. But now there are things that, overall, what I'd say is, is one common observation is that, um, and it's a good thing, is that we need a lot of conversation here to do things in Hawaii. I'm used to things moving more quickly. Uh, it, at my other university, so things move a bit slower. But in the end, it's a good thing because you have to get more buy-in. And once you have buy-in, when things go forward, and people don't try to carp at it, and which can happen when you do things in a quicker way, people then say, "Well, I always knew that wasn't going to work, and I didn't want to do it in the first place." So, so it, there's, you know, like most things here, you know, it's a two-sided coin. There's it's a very unique place with some tremendous benefits. But then there are things that you have to take into account in order to, to achieve that. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. Along that same line, is there any move to try to get a bond together? Um, autonomy of the, of the university. The university. We lost it. Well, we had it in certain things. We still have it. So we're still more, we're far more autonomous than most state agencies. Uh, you know, we carry money over. In, in funds that other state agencies can't do. So, you know, your department uh, has money sitting in a, in a pool that if it doesn't spend it this year, it can think about spending it next year. Most state agencies can't do that. So we, we have more autonomy in that sense than any other state agency. Um, we lost our autonomy in, in doing purchasing independently um, and things like that. So it's, it's always a, it probably tilts depending on the, the latest. The, there's no question that Stevie Wonder uh, blunder caused a problem and the lack of confidence, and so that has made the legislature look more closely at how the university runs and things, and and perhaps put a, a bit more. You know, we had budget provisos and a bit more scrutiny on the university. Uh, the only way to to move that back is to show that we can do things well and that we run well and that's that's about having good processes in place and that's something we can control. That's something we need to do uh, and we need to improve all of our processes, make sure they're more efficient and that, th that they work well and that there's good efficiencies and checks and balances. So that's part of doing business better than we do it today. The, NC, the NCA ruling about letting uh, some of the private schools now uh, become unionized uh, in the athletics for their students. Um, that hasn't come to the public sector yet, but I've been reading that there is a lot of discussion on the mainland side. 
Yeah, uh, th this is a conversation that's, of course, been really going on for decades. In fact, I can tell you back in, uh, in the 80s when I was at Nebraska, the, the ledge used to have a bill every year about whether we should pay the football team, uh, uh, the players on the football team, because the university was making you know, millions of dollars on, on football. So that conversation and the, the unionization at Northwestern and things like that, uh, whether that ruling will stand uh, or not from the, from the, the, the federal judge uh, is yet to be seen. But this is a conversation that's happening nationwide. I, I think that uh, college athletics, particularly at Division I and particularly in the major revenue generating sports, has really become somewhat distorted by the enormous TV revenues. Uh, and that, you know, we all, I think we all agree that something's broken, but we don't quite know how to fix it. Um, the, uh, the, the television contracts, if you're one of the major football conferences right now, all of the sports, if you're in one of the major conferences, all the athletic departments actually run at a, now run at a surplus because they get over $20 million a year from television contracts. Uh, just to put that in perspective, our TV contract here is $2.3 million a year. $20 million a year uh, brings most of those uh, sports programs into the black. And because of that, they do everything they can to preserve that TV revenue. And the more competitive they are, if they get in bowl games, it's another five or six million dollars and things. And that can distort, you know, how you, uh, the kinds of practices that you engage in. It can distort the, the concept of the student athlete. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, temptations there when the money is that big. And uh, I, it, to me, it can't really be a healthy environment. It's not a healthy environment. And uh, I think you, when you have your football coach making $5 million a year and your average professor, full professor making 120000 a year, that's, that's really skewed when you have a 40 to 1 ratio there. Uh, where an entire, actually the, the faculty in an entire big department make less than the football coach. That's just not right. Um, now what's going to happen, how, the, how will this shake out, uh, I really have no idea. Um, at some point you're, you're talking about really becoming semi-pro teams and at that point we have to ask are these really student athletes? Uh, if, if you're going to start paying students to, to play football, then maybe they ought to just be, maybe it ought to be a minor league like they have in baseball. You know, baseball has a minor league, and they pay people to play on that, and they're not associated with the universities. So I think it's gotten a little out of hand. bothered me for many, many years is that uh, growing up in Hawaii it's a wonderful atmosphere for athletics. There are many really gifted athletes here who never get a chance to play in Hawaii because the recruitment process seems to be focused on the mainland and many of our athletes here have to go begging to the mainland to get into any program. Is that recognized? Is it um, looked at? <laughs> Is there perhaps some ideas about readjusting that focus in the upper echelons of power here? Well, um, we of course can't tell these athletes where to, we recruit very heavily in the islands and, in, uh, and of course most of our athletes are from Hawaii. Uh, but we lose the Marcus Mariotas and the Manti Teos to the big conferences because they want to play on NBC or CBS. Uh, in the you know they want to play in the PAC or in the Big Ten or or one of the big major conferences and that's you know and and I like to I like to remind people of this too that uh, we are a higher ranked university in the international rankings than both Notre Dame and Oregon are. Uh, we're 153rd in the world rankings 
and Notre Dame's between three and four hundred on that same ranking, and Oregon's between three hundred and four hundred. So, uh, you know, these are are student athletes who are going off to universities that have big football names, of course, uh, and they have the chance to vie for national titles, and they get to play in front of a national audience on TV. Uh, but the universities are going to are not as highly ranked as we are in the in terms of uh, the world rankings. So um, those are trade-offs. If uh, maybe if if we are part of the pack whatever, the Pac-16, if it grows to that, maybe some of them will stay home because they'll have the opportunity uh, to, to play in front of the national audience. Um, but, you know, Coach Chow certainly recruits a lot here in the islands and hopes to get those, those top prospects and keep them here uh, in the state. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of parents send their, their kids off to pay three times the tuition on the mainland to schools that aren't as ranked as high as we are. How many parents send their kids to, you know, Oregon or Oregon State or Arizona State or, or, the, or so on, and uh, and those schools are none of them are ranked as high as we are, but they're willing to pay. Uh, you know, tuition here is nine thousand, and they'll pay twenty-five or if it's private thirty, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a year uh, for four years. Uh, populist as being more sophisticated in some way no. rather than really doing their homework and seeing what no. the real rankings are. Another thing is, is that this has bothered me for a long time and obviously a lot of people in that the, the sports section of a university has become a university in itself. And these people are not training academically, they're training sports-wise to get into the major teams, pro teams. As you've mentioned already, you don't think that's a good thing. Is there any way of reversing that trend and getting the, let's see, the athletic department more heavily back into mainstream academic? academics and getting people who are in the the athletic program to be more a part of and coming out of the academic sphere rather than going out and you know and recruiting these people I hate to use the word mercenary but it begins to look like that sometimes yeah and and I do want to make sure I didn't uh, convey that I think that happens here um, just let me throw out a little bit of data uh, here. And, and, and we're not the big time athletics programs where I do think that they've been completely. So I, I taught, I'll just tell you, I taught at uh, the University of Nebraska for eight years and I never saw an athlete in my chemistry class in eight years. That wouldn't happen here. Uh, but at Nebraska it was more like a pro, you know, the Huskers were sort of like a almost a semi-pro team. That wouldn't happen here. Our student athletes here outperform the general student body by about 0.05 in GPA and they have higher graduation rates. And in some sports, um, I went to uh, Dave Shoji's team's banquet and uh, the, the MC said, will the young ladies who have a 3.0 or better please stand up and the whole team stood up. And then, well, how many of you are on the dean's list? And maybe two people sat down. And then a couple had perfect 4.0s. And even, even in some of the sports, you'd expect the lowest performance, which are the big money sports, where you might say, well, we lower the bar because we're more concerned about <coughs> making money. Um, I think our seniors on the football team, 17 out of 18 graduated on time. And that's a a number that, you know, in the general student body, we don't do anywhere near as well. So I do think our coaches, our AD, uh, and, and we've got really, really good academic support people. And it, I think what's really telling is if you look at a sport like basketball, you look at men's and women's basketball, the fact that our students in those sports are doing well 
says a lot about the people and the efforts that are being made to get students to graduate. Because when you think about basketball, you've got 30-some games, 15 of which are away, and they're in both semesters. So it's not like you, you can have students take a light spring because that's when they play. In basketball, both semesters get screwed up, if you will. And they're on the road for 15, 16 games, and yet they're still performing right there with the, with the student body in terms of GPA, in terms of success rates and getting degrees and so on. So I think we've got some real, I mean, that, that should be a point of pride here for our athletics program. Um, when I was making those comments, I really meant the big, you know, the Alabamas, Texas, you know, Nebraska, where I really think the sports takes on a whole life of itself. Uh, yeah. I mean, they really, it's really at a different level in those, at, at those schools. Yeah. Well, it, uh, in, in, I guess part of that, those people that do that are part of the athletics budget. But before people start to think that athletics is this big losing money proposition, we ought to remember that when we say it loses money, we give it about 32% of its budget, and it's responsible for bringing in the other 68%. We don't hold other units to that account. Um, quite frankly, and I don't want to name names, but we lose a lot more money in some other things that we do, uh, some other academic programs, the, where we invest a lot, and if you were to do, if you were an accountant with a green eye shade, and you were to look at semester hours taught or degrees granted, and the money we invest in those areas, you'd find areas that lose more money. And then there's cash cows. There's areas where, you know, you add all the faculty and staff salaries together, and then look at the number of students taking the courses and the number of students graduating. And again, if you're a bean counter, you say, wow, this is a cash cow. So we have some academic programs that make us tens of millions of dollars, and we have some that consume actually quite a bit more than athletics does. But what we, what's nice about a university is we realize that we're all in this together, and we shouldn't be bean counters because there's certain values in these, in these different things. I think that the money we spend here on athletics is money well spent because it gives the state a point of pride it gives the, us something to follow. And most importantly, the students outperform the regular student body and they graduate. And they up our graduation numbers and make us look better because they actually academically outperform. Now, it's true, those students get a little extra help, but they're also faced with the travel and all those kind of things. So, a good expenditure. Yeah. That being said, Chancellor, I've never heard a coach refer to an athlete as a sociology major or a religion major in our sports information office. I've never seen any of the press materials refer to what these athletes do besides athletics. And if they indeed are student athletes, I think we're hiding our, our candle under a bushel here and we should encourage both the coaches and the sports information office to start pumping more information out about what these student athletes or scholar athletes do as students or scholars. I have seen be better. Agreed. Can I just add a fun fact? Did you, uh, were you around when Marcus Mariota was recruited? Or when he was in the process of his senior year? No, that was before I got here. I went to school with him, and uh, he and his parents actually said, uh, UH offered him no such uh, scholarship, as opposed to Oregon offering him the four year full blown deal. And I just thought that was shocking. The senior year at UH would have just jumped on him. I agree.
I hope that wouldn't happen today. <laughs> There's a different, uh, different uh, coach and different staff down there, but, but I hope today we'd be on top of that, and I hope the current Marcus Mariota who's playing for uh, you know, St. Louis or something is getting, uh, getting recruited. Yeah. I see Denise sitting there. Did, did everyone see the news that Carl Bonham was picked to head the Congressional Budget Office by President Obama? How, how spectacular is that, that a University of Hawaii faculty member gets chosen to head the Congressional Budget Office? Pretty amazing. They really got us. <laughs> you know, that's a that's a position that usually they look at. They look at uh, Harvard or or uh, Wharton or something or Goldman Sachs or something like that to fill. So that's a, a huge, huge feather in the cap of uh, University of Hawaii. Last chance to beat up the chancellor, stump the chancellor. I just want to say thank you for putting up with the stupid old <laughs> Well, you know, it's all good. It's all good. It's uh, actually these conversations, and, and I get asked some really tough questions by by you folks. It really gets you thinking, you you know, and gets us working on problems and you know, some of the times as we work on them, you know, we, we don't get them done. And that's something that, you know, keeping that momentum going, it, it's good for me to come here and hear sometimes, and I, you know, I hear in some of you some of the frustrations and things that we're not getting done, and that's all good. It's good for me to hear that, because then I can get folks energized to get some of these things done. And hear a lot of great ideas out of these conversations that really have made a difference. So. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you speaking your mind. And uh, it keeps us motivated. So thank you. Yes? Um, can you tell us about um, how we're perceiving Korea and Japan? Oh, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for asking that. I asked about Korea and Japan. Yeah, so uh, it's all Vital to go overseas, uh, and and I and a number of us were fortunate to go to Korea and Japan in the last week and a half. And the reception we get there, and the respect for this university is unbelievable. And you know, let me put this in context, and I, I hope you don't mind me keeping saying this, but I've I've traveled overseas from other universities, and Hawaii is a whole different respect in Asia. Than, than most of the universities on the mainland. And they really appreciate what we do here. And the alumni, that I, I, we had three alumni group meetings, one in Tokyo, one in Kansai, and, and Seoul. And our alumni are fervid at, at a level that's just hard to believe. They love this university. They want to help in any way they can in all the kinds of, they want to help us recruit students to come to UH. They want to help students who are in program any way they can, and they want to hire our graduates, and they want to give us money. They're, they just love this university, and there's a respect for UH overseas that uh, they realize we're invested in Asia, that we'll always be there, and we always have been there. Uh, you know, when, when I was traveling in China, you know, Sun Yat-sen was here. Sigmund Rhee spent time here in Honolulu when you're in Korea. There's a, in Vietnam, when we were in Vietnam, Hawaii always kept ties to Vietnam, even during what they refer to as the American War. And so Hawaii is a special place. And then the, the, the East-West Center, 
uh, has had an enormous impact. Um, we're received incredibly well there. We get, when we would visit, a, we were at the Korean Academy, over the, uh, the, the Korean Studies Academy, and their president took the whole morning off and spent three or four hours with us, showing us around, giving us a tour, taking us through their archives, going to lunch with us. I mean, the, 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 the import that they take, I should mention one of our alums in China is uh, uh, the vice minister of education. And the vice ministers are the ones that really do the work. This is a ministry that has 300 million, has charge of 300 million people in China. So the, essentially the population of the U.S. And when I w visited him, he said, you know, I've had the presidents of Stanford, Harvard, Berkeley sitting in that chair, but I've never been this proud because now I have my president sitting there. It was UH. And he's actually, despite being the vice minister of education, his name's Hao Ping, he's writing a book, and the book is on King Kalakaua. So he got his master's in history here, still a scholar, loves UH, like you wouldn't believe, vice minister. We have the, I believe it's the interior minister in the Philippines, UH grad, Minister ba Balascon, I believe. So, I mean, an incredible reputation in Asia. In Vietnam, when you talk about an executive MBA program, what's the best executive MBA program? Anybody you ask will tell you it's UH. You don't hear Wharton, you don't hear Harvard, you hear UH. The Vemba program is considered the absolute pinnacle of executive education in, in Vietnam. So we, we've got a lot going for us in Asia. We're really, really, uh, if, if you go to China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, those Philippines, and you ask what are the best universities in the world, and ask them all to name their top ten, we'll be on most people's list. Well, listen, keep doing all the great stuff you're doing. I think, uh, I really Keep after us. Keep us. Keep our noses to the ta our nose to the grindstone. Keep us to the task, and uh, we'll try to make this an even better university. Thanks for all that you do.